day always give me the support that I need. Let's pray. Loving Father, come by here, I pray thee, and speak through me to your people. In Jesus' name. Today, I'd like to speak on the subject, Restoring Broken Relationship. What is it? Restoring Broken Relationships. Now, at some point or other, in our relationships, we have broken. And there is no perfect relationship. And so every relationship experiences challenges. Challenges, misunderstandings, lapse in judgment, disagreement, emotional instability. Sometimes it's traveling up the rough side of the mountain. Did you know, friends, that our ability to be happy in relationships, be it work relationship, church relationship, family relationship, our ability to be happy in relationship depends upon our ability to resolve conflict. Amen? And so that's the test, the true test of our capability to maintain a relationship. How you resolve conflict. As a matter of fact, friends, do you want to know whether a person will divorce later in life? Can I talk to you? Do you want to know whether a person will divorce later in life? Yes, you can know. And how can you know that? Thank you. How can you know that? Yes, essentially by observing how they resolve conflicts today. Amen. You are dating somebody. not a bad thing sometimes if you have a little disagreement. It's not a bad thing if you have some misunderstanding and conflict. Why is that so? You get an opportunity to see them in their true colors. Is that clear? For it is said that there are some herbs that never reveal their aroma until bloom. And so if you want to understand who a person really is, just observe how they resolve This is why. Colors are demonstrated in our home. Did you know Ellen White says that it is how we relate in our home that will essentially determine our fitness level? How we resolve. And so today, the subject, restoring broken relationships. I want to share with you very quickly, if you have your pen and paper, you know, you can take a bit of notes or you can listen or wait for the tape. It says that the shortest pencil is better than the longest memory. So it's okay if you want to do a little bit of writing, that's all right. I want to share with you today six techniques for resolving conflicts and restoring broken relationships. How many? Six fundamental components of conflict 
resolution. First of all, let's hear a little about conflict resolution. Conflict resolution skills. Did you know, friends, that one of the most important life skills for happiness in this life is conflict resolution techniques and skills? If we are to live and interact successfully with people, learning how to resolve conflict is crucial. Marriage or ability to resolve conflict will determine our happiness. And so, friends, three things happen when we fail to resolve conflicts effectively. Number one, we become distant. Number two, we become demanding. And number three, we become defensive. Oh, have you heard of people living in the same home for days and weeks? And even months? And they are not speaking to each other. They are changed. They walk by each other. And they do not touch each other. Oh, you don't know about this. They become distant. They become demanding. Did I tell you that? You should do this or that. Demanding. Or they become defensive. A brick wall. We can never get through to them. So they're always. Failure to effectively resolve conflict. And so, friends, it's important that you understand this. You must learn how to resolve conflict. You see, there are two kinds of people in a relationship. Two kinds. How many? Two kinds. I like when you, I like when you talk to me now. How many kinds? Two kinds. You are either a, a disaster of relationship or you are a master of relationship. You see, the disaster of relationship does not mean it. If the relationship is ruptured, if it's spiraling down, I only want know that I win. I want to win this argument. Even though the relationship I want to know I perform a good operation. Even though the patient dies. I want to win the war. That's the disaster. Then don't be disturbed. But on the other hand, there is the master of relationship. The master of relationship is always seeking an opportunity to repair the relationship. Amen. Did you know that every relationship needs repair at all times? Lapse in judgment. You can give credit. You can understand. So our ability to, to maintain that relationship depends upon our ability to resolve it. Now, three things to remember. Unresolved conflicts damage our lives in three ways. Number one, unresolved conflicts blocks my relationship with God. First John 4 verse 20, we cannot love God while hating people. We cannot be right with God and wrong with people. People, he says, if you say you love, if you hate your brother, whom you can see, but you say you love me, whom you cannot see, then the truth is not real with you. Is that clear? Did you know, friend, that there are some people they hate, just hate? Maybe not you, somewhere else. Let me confuse you. 
Some people just hate people. They, they just love to hate to harbor resentment and hurt. Did you know, friends, it seems like some people get a thrill out of just keeping malice. Oh, me, I would like to talk to them. It's, it's, it's two years now, Pastor, and me, they wrong me. I am not a fish. I'm not some mumbi pumbi jellyfish to just go up to them. I'm going to hold it in my heart against them until I die. Friends, did you know that as members of the church and followers of the Lamb, as, as sojourners on this on, on this road to, to, to eternal salvation, did you know that we have to be in the habit of resolving conflicts every step of the way? That's our life work. That's our mantra. That's our modus operandi. That's our life work. Resolving conflicts and making it right. Amen. So watch this now. Unresolved conflicts block my relationship with God. Number two, unresolved conflicts block my prayers. Did you know that? Oh, yes. First Peter 3 and verse 7. Even those who are married, did you know, friends, that when we hold on to Jesus, it's not good for us as Christians. It's not healthy. What you know what the Bible says there? First Peter 3 and verse 7. He says, talking to, to like husband, husband, dwell with them according to knowledge. Is that right? Giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. And as being heirs together, thank you so much, of the grace of life. Why? Why should you treat your spouse well? Thank you for this, Mike. Why should we spell? Did you know, friends, the Bible says that our prayers be not hindered. First Peter 3 and verse 7. Did you know that the wrong treatment of your spouse can cause God to block his ears when you pray. So do you understand then that in our marriage, in our marriages, we cannot treat it lightly. Oh, I just hurt her, but I don't care. Morning, I have to pray at church. So you got the, you got the Bible and you're walking. I'm going to church. I left her crying, but I don't care. That's how I show I'm, I'm a man. But I don't bow to any woman. Do you know that God's people the people and we give an understanding? God's people are what? Gentle people. The wrong treatment of her spouse can cause God to block his ears. That's serious, isn't that so? And so, the next thing we must remember is this, that unresolved conflicts can block our prayers. Number three, unresolved conflicts block our happiness. We reap what we sow. Is that right? We reap what we sow. So if I hurt a person, if I sow 
lives. Trust me. We reap what we sow. By the way, as a matter of fact, we normally even reap more than what we sow. That's the law of vegetation. It's not right. If I sow a corn, if I put a corn in the ground, oh, pastor, I'm reaping, man. I'm reaping corn in the car. I'm not just reaping one corn. Oh, no, I'm reaping hundreds. We normally reap more than we sow. This is why the Bible says, fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Oh, we treat our kids anyhow, but later on we expect them to run behind us and to love us still. Distancing yourself from your children now will only encourage the generation gap later. Do you understand how we must be careful how we even relate to our children? Also, we must be careful how we relate to our spouse. Isn't that right? We hurt our spouse with words that wound deeply. She utters words that are tearing his heart apart. Hurtful words in the morning. When he comes home, she expects many goodies. Hello. Did you buy that pair of shoes for me today? Yet he left the home in tears. Did you know it is not only men? It is not only the men who transmit pain. Did you know that ladies transmit pain too? Hello? Oh. Can I say something to my wonderful ladies today? You know, one of the most effective ways that a lady hurt her is if she talks in you. You may not try to pick and choose, but you try to give the choice. And did you know that some folk use the tree in such vile ways so often that it's nothing? But you just hurt him. I, I hurt him? Really? And you just hurt him with your words. That's so hard. You believe him. You discredit him. You discredit him. You dehumanize. I did that. I didn't do that. He's too thin skinned. What's wrong with him? Oh. We reap what we sow. Amen. So if you bring home winter weather, you expect your you can't expect to have a summer wife if you bring home winter weather. Amen. You can't expect it to be always growing and flourishing if it's always snowing and hailing. No, if we want to reap good harvest, we must sow good seed that day. Okay? I like what the Bible says in Proverbs 16:24. He says, Pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. What do you say? If you want a home that is always flourishing, if you want a home where you are celebrating each other, you must plant words that uplift. What do you say? Words that affirm, words that celebrate one another. Then you will have an atmosphere of appreciation in your home. The children will delight to dwell there. The wife will find it a place where she's always skipping and shouting and singing for she's happy to be home. We call that a we call that emotional intelligence. It's needed in every relationship. How do you make me feel when I'm in your presence? The husband will find it a home. Oh, he can't wait till five o'clock. 
just to leave work and he gets home even five minutes early. But in this form, he's encouraging. And so, friends, unresolved conflict block our happiness. Exactly. Very quickly now, write these six things I want to share with you now. How to resolve conflicts. Number one, number one, make the first move. Amen. What do you say? Make the first move. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. What does the Bible say here? Matthew 5, 23 and 24. I, I think you're still with me over there, my audiovisual unit team. Matthew, what is it? Matthew 5 and verse? All right. Let's read that together. Let's read that. Matthew 5, 23. Listen to it. Therefore, if what? Thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath fought against thee. What verse 24 says? Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. What is that? What does that mean? What does that mean? If we are Christians <laughs> and we come to worship and we know our brother has ought, not even us having ought against them, but even they have the ought against that means if we know we left our husband broken at home, emotionally, or our wife pining away because of how we have hurt her, and we come to church to worship, God is saying, okay, take a little break. He's saying, what you do, you leave your gifts. Hello? In other words, leave your offering. Don't take it to the table. Need to offer. But go back home, is that right? And reconcile with them and then come again to worship. In other words, in God's economy, reconciling with your brother is more important than worship. In other words, it takes priority over worship. Oh, preacher, what is that? Did you know Christ? That our relationship with God is inextricably bound to our relationship with people. That's what God is saying. Look at the Ten Commandments. Two tables of stone. Is that clear? Two tables of stone. On one hand, we have our duty to God. On the other side, our duty to our fellow man. Is that right? We cannot be wrong with people and say we are right with God. Both go hand in hand. We must resolve conflicts with our family and friends. Then, come to worship. The Bible says, how do we do it? Make the first move. Oh, Pastor, I'm waiting for them to come. It's been 10 years. And they haven't come yet. They wrong me. I'm not going to them. But you see, we are the Christians. We have the formula. God has given us the wisdom. We know the path to reconciliation. So we make the first move. Amen. What about that? We make the first move. Or how can we worship God with a clean and clear conscience when our heart is filled with guilt based on our ruptured relationship with Christ? And we make no effort to reconcile. So he's saying, make the first move. Amen. Did you know, friends? There's been people. Who have been at odds with others for 10, 20, 30 years. And one gets up one day and goes and says, Well, I'm sorry. 
I want to make it right. When that thing happened 20 years ago, I was just so selfish. I was only thinking about myself. But now I want to make it right. Thanks for that. Thanks. Oh, I've been waiting on this 20 years. Exactly. Immediately, a weight is lifted from their heart. 20 years of burden. And they feel that they can live again. Why? Because you made the first move. So what? Make the first move. You must understand the nature of sin. Man, many times in sin, he doesn't know. He doesn't have the humility. He doesn't have the, the, the spirit of God in him to prompt him. But we who have the formula, we make the first move. That's number one. Number two, take responsibility for at least a part of the problem. Exercise humility. Amen. Oh, ten of inspiration says, friends, that about 90% of the Conflicts in marriages can be resolved if we only possess humility. Amen. Isn't that right? Go before the person and say, I was wrong. Hello? When we get married, you know, friends, marriage is not for the immature person, you know. Marriage is for those who are mature enough to say, I'm sorry. I wronged you. I was selfish. I was only thinking of myself. I was so foolish. Please forgive me. Amen. So we say, let's go up. He's not. And be real Christians. And real Christians. Humble people. So take responsibility for at least part of the Number three, listen to their hurt and perspective. Mm -mm -mm. Hello? Oh, friends, it's a big problem in relationships. Did you know, friends, I've seen many relationships on the verge of divorce. You know why? Because people will not listen to each other. Oh, one man says, oh, you know, I, my wife does not understand me. Why do you say that? Because she will not listen to me. I want to talk about that. Yes. I have a message just on the subject of listening. My husband, my husband will not listen. Did you know, friends, a lot of women are talking. A lot of wives are talking. But the husband is too busy with his work. Too busy with everything else. And he is not listening. Do you know when he starts listening? Oh, you're sleeping on me. Are you still with me today? Do you know when he starts listening? It's when he come home, Pastor. And he, he gets a, a letter in the mail. From the attorney of And he reads it. What happened? I didn't know you were going through this. She says, but I was talking. But I didn't know you took it so seriously. She said, but I was talking. Talking through my tears. Talking through my shouts. Talking through my pain, but you were not listening. Oh! <laughs> Can you please give me another chance? Sorry, it's too late. You were not listening. Friends, there are many of us. Many. You know, there are some who believe that their spouse will be with them for all time. So I can treat her or him anyhow. He's not going to leave me. He's only my storm. 
I can tell him anything. I can treat her anyhow. She will always be there. And they are crying every day. But they don't care to listen. Friends, listen. If we start to listen, we can save our relationship. I have a presentation on this. Why you should listen. You know why we should listen? When we listen, we show that we respect their perspective, isn't that? We respect their pain. That's why we listen. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I'm tired of listening. What you're saying, you don't care about the way I feel. I have a story to tell, but you're not listening. And you don't care to listen, so you don't care about me. You, you have no respect for my feelings, my hurt, my pain, even my opinion. It means nothing. So a failure to listen demonstrates a disregard for the other person. Listening is a big And how we listen. Mm -hmm. We don't know to talk. We put away the music. We put away the cue. Oh, oh, talk on this. Don't you think this is talk, talk on this? Hello? We don't know to talk. Do you know? I mean, I, ha I, I have to develop that too, especially this phone. Amen. My wife said, sometimes, I have to catch myself. And I have to keep, I have to live what I receive. So I take my hand the phone because what? She is there. Is that right? Because when we, when we try to merge with her, we are watching the TV. Yes, I'm listening. No, but we show this way. Is that clear? So we must learn. We must develop that, okay? We must listen. We must listen, and we must listen to their hurt and the perspective. Number four, speak the truth tactfully. Wow, that's a big one. What? Speak the truth tactfully. Oh, no, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. I'm going to let the splinters fall where they may. I don't care. Need it. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello, friends. Did you know some people can be unkind with your words? Oh, no, but it's the truth. Watch this. Did you know <laughs> we may have the truth, even of the gospel, but if we say it the wrong way, we could turn a soul to hell who would otherwise be saved. <laughs> oh, please trust me, Pastor, this morning, you know, when you, you said something about loving them and doing well. That's so beautiful. Love them. They will stay. Is that right? Love them. They will stay. Is that right? Just this morning, I read something somebody sent me. Try to not get bored. Read it. Okay? Listen. He says, we should be kind to people's mistakes. Oh, I want to say, I, I want you to get this one now. So, if you, if your brain is a little droopy, I'd like you to wake up. Amen. Okay. Wake up. When Pastor was preaching, he said, Fire, fire. Fire, 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 Are you still with me today? I read that little story this morning. You know what he said? 
be gentle with the mistake. He says, the young man went to church. He's thrown around in the middle of the preaching service. Mm. By the end of the service, everybody started chiding him. Oh, he got a good lecture. From the people. The usher stormed him. All the members of the church issued the world sponsor. How can you allow that? You turned everybody's mind away from the service. You didn't learn how to conduct yourself in church. When he was going home, his wife too gave him a lecture. She says, You embarrass me. I expected better from you. Then he says, That young man never went to the church. But after that, he went to a bar. No bar, right? We call it the pub here, right? And you know what happened there? He was picking up a glass. I don't know if it was right rum, you know. Heavy stuff, right? And then the glass broke. He was fumbling, and accidentally, the glass broke. Some of the beverage spilled and some of the people were fired. Everybody ran. Oh, sorry, sorry. It's, oh, never mind. It's not your fault. And everybody came to him and said, okay, it's okay. It happens. And another person came and said, oh, I'm sorry. We just want to make sure you're not hurt. And everybody flocked him, you know. I said, wow, you're a good man. But I know, you know, everybody make mistakes. Not only that, even the bartender. He says, never mind, man, I give you another drink. He never stopped going to the bar. We must be gentle. We must be gentle with the mistakes of others. Amen. It's not about what we say, but it's how we say. It may be the truth. Oh, it's the truth. I'm going to kill them with the truth. But then they die. <laughs> the Bible says a brother offended is hard to win. Of course, you know, there are times, there's a place for honest rebuke and reproof. But there's also a place to be gentle with your mistake. And so, friends, speak the truth. Amen. It's not right. Oh, the Bible reminds us, friends, about what? Be, be wise as a serpent. It's not right. And harmless as a dove. We can't be living every day without wisdom. Talking to people. You know, Ellen White says we, we, are, we, are, we are dealing with mind every day. That's our life. So we have to drop our words. Speak the truth tactfully. Number five. Attack problem, not people. <laughs> Are you with me? Attack problem, not people. So we don't keep, instead of saying that you, 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 you did this, you do. Every time we say that you in our marriage, every time we say you made it wrong, you always, and you never did anything good, and you always wrong. Every time we say you, the dark to the eye. The husband makes a mistake. He comes to see a guest. Daddy. The wife makes a mistake. I want to 
It's easy to go back to that. But there are some words we never use in our English. There are some words we could never use. I'm going to talk about that. So instead of using the word you, because every time we do that, what do we do? We erode yourself. But instead of using the word you, 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 what should we do? We use the I statement. Is that right? You know, I would pick. You know, when this happened, I feel a punch. You see, when you use the I statement, you don't attack anybody. You're only expressing how you feel. Is that right? And nobody can deny how you feel. We should, we sometimes, we, we will spend some time. But what? We attack problem, not people. Finally, number six. Be ready to forgive and apologize. Amen? Be ready to forgive and apologize. There are some relationships that can never be repaired. And repaired successfully. Until we apologize. Amen. So apology for God's people must be a habit that is frequently demonstrated in our home. Apology and forgiveness. It is said that a good marriage is the union of two great forgivers. That's all you do. You're always forgiving. Always. You know, friends. I'm going to say this. That if we have judged people, some people think I'm judged us before we heal the truth. Back to Time of those people say, Oh, listen to me, friends. Remember that text we used today. Proverbs. What does it say? Proverbs. 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 And it says that in our relationship, in our relationship, Proverbs 13. Let's put it on that screen for you guys. Proverbs 13. Our memory text today. Proverbs 18 and verse 13. The other way around. Watch this now. This is, this is loaded. This text is loaded. What is it? He that answereth a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame unto him. In other words, don't jump to conclusion until you hear the full story. Amen. Is that clear? Is why if you heard something, don't just adopt the herd mentality and run with it before verifying the fact. Did you know that there are many people in jail today? In jail today because they were tried, tried. And given a verdict. But they never had an opportunity. To tell their story. You know it was Churchill one time. You know a lady came to Churchill and said. You know he pointed over to a young man. Over there. I said you know I don't like him. Look at him. I don't like him. You know what Churchill said? He said you don't like him? Why don't you get to know him? Hello today. Oh, friends, this is what you some. Sometimes you may think you don't like somebody, but if you get to know them, you may discover that they are the nicest people you have ever met. Nicest person you have ever met. Get to know them. Amen. 
That's not just one of them. If we hear it and we listen to it, the Bible uses strong language. Read that verse in, in many renderings of the Bible. The Bible says, if you answer it, a matter. If you draw a conclusion before you hear the full story, it is an embarrassment. Another person says, oh, it is shame and folly. Another one says, it's a disgrace. Hello, friend, did you know it's a serious thing? We don't just judge the book by its cover. Is that right? We get the facts, amen? And so sometimes, you know, friends, we'll have to, by misjudging people, Making assumption, you may have to go and say so. What is it that occurred with your spouse that you must apologize for? What is it? It's not a bad thing to apologize. No. You see, when we apologize, my friends, apology is an acknowledgement that you are not perfect. Amen. When you apologize, it's a good thing. It's, it demonstrates your maturity. You want your offering to your offering to make it right. And you demonstrate that you acknowledge and appreciate and respect their dignity. But you feel what they felt. That's what apology is really saying. You feel what they felt. So I apologize. And when you apologize, the person feels a sense of freedom that you understand. Today, friends, we have it in the scripture today. I want to end with this. Christians are people who know how to apologize when they're wrong. Is that right? That's the difference between Judas and Peter. Judas was not concerned about the relationship between himself and Jesus. So when he wronged Jesus, he didn't turn around to apologize. He was moving headlong into destruction. I got to be right. I'm following my own way. But when we respect the relationship, we will apologize. On the other hand, Peter, even though Peter denied his Lord, hello today, even though Peter denied his Lord, Jesus looked at him. He saw the look of compassion in Jesus' eyes. And he was broken with repentance. Peter said, just help me, Jesus. Just give me an opportunity and I'm going to make it right. Oh, friends, at Pentecost, oh, you should see Peter in all his glory. Because he was happy for being restored to the relationship with his father. Amen. Oh, we have David, David, David. If you, if you forgot about David, you forgot it all. Psalm 151, friends, then David. Why was David called a, a man after God's own heart? Because David knew how to apologize. In his heart, nothing was Im more important to him. Than the relationship with himself. Ah, is that right? Oh, when he, when, when he felt as though he was being separated from his father, he says, Please restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. In other words, all I want in life is to be in good relationship. And so he says, purge me. <laughs> I like it. Purge me with hyssop. Oh, when you study hyssop, friend, hyssop was a herb. He used the terminology to mean something. Oh, back in the day when I was a young boy, man, and I took herb. Oh, you don't know about that? Hmm? Huh? Oh, wow. Herb. And everything Lord unhindered. Is that right? David used the terminology because David says, I want to be cleansed without and within. So purge me with hyssop. Cleanse me entirely for I must be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. But 
why he was a man of the Lord. He was victorious. Some of us sometimes think that we have dropped it and doing it before our spouse. Say I'm sorry. What can I do? First of all, I want to present us to Jesus. It doesn't matter what we have been through. It doesn't matter what we have been. Oh, hallelujah. It doesn't matter what we have been through. We have betrayed the innocent blood. But today, like James. Wife will come and sing it to us. A song of praise. Just giving us an opportunity to reconnect with Jesus. And when we reconnect with Jesus, it will be easy to reconnect with our family. Sure.
Jesus. This is the first first point, first week of the week. And today, it doesn't matter what you do for Jesus. You have not yet made that decision. You said, Jesus, I trust my heart completely. You have not yet made that decision. You just want to check. I love you with all my heart. Please help me. I want to be in your church. Just raise your hand. I want to pray for somebody. You have not yet made the decision to do this. But today can be your day. You want to start with your church. I want to pray for somebody. Show your hand. Raise your hand everywhere. I want to pray for you. You may be online. God bless you. I see the hand. You may be online. Just, 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 just. Breathe a prayer in your heart, even online right now, and say, Jesus, I want to be your child. I want to trust my heart to you. But this is the best day. God bless you. My second appeal, my friends, to those who are members of this church, those who have already been the followers of the Lamb today. I want to say, Jesus, I want to be in a better place. I want to be a better husband, a better father, a better son. I want to be a better sibling. I want to be a better member of the family to which I belong. Friends, I first of all want to start by saying, Jesus, I trust my heart to you. Make me a better person. I'm always in need of your help. For I cannot do this on my own. You want to join me today? Here, somebody want to join me today and say, Jesus, I want to be a better person, better family member. I want to be a better family member, a better church member, a better citizen. I want to be better by your grace. Just raise your hand. I want to pray for somebody today. God bless you. Friends, when we are at a better place with God, we are at an improved state in our family. Amen. Could you please stand those who just raised their hand? Amen. By Pastor. Could you just please uh, give us that prayer of dedication? Let us pray. Loving Father and God, creator of mankind, sustainer of the universe, we owe our very existence to you, for it is indeed in you that we live and move and have our being. Today as we come, like your servant Isaiah, woe is me, for I am incomplete. We come, Lord, recognizing our nothingness. We come recognizing your all-sufficiency, your power to restore, to heal, to make right. And so we fall as broken vessels at your feet. And ask you, O oh God, as the master potter, to put us back together again. Thank you, God, for your servant messenger. You spoke through him in accents clear and still. We know the most important thing is not just to be hearers of your word, but to be doers also. So help us now, Lord, to go and do to make practical that which we have heard. I pray for your children here standing today. An acknowledgement, O oh God, that we need to be closely drawn to you. An acknowledgement of the fact that without you we are nothing. But also recognizing that with you, all will be well. Bless us individually. Speak to our consciences as persons. And help us, dear Father, not to listen to a message on behalf of somebody else. But just as Isaiah said, Hear my Lord, send me. Even so, as individuals, may we say, Lord, here I am. Cleanse me. Thanks again, Lord, for your word. Entrance to which gives light and life. Seal in our hearts, O oh God, the importance of forging a relationship with you, a sustained relationship, one that will last into eternity. May we develop a hunger, a thirst for righteousness, 
subdued heart, a willingness to do the right. Use us here, Father God, for your service and for your holy purpose. As we recommit, rededicate our hearts to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. By the way, I had uh, said at 2.30 to come back over for, and I, didn't, I was not aware that they had changed it. So if you want to come back over at 2.30, uh, we'll have uh, some singing until 3 o'clock at that time. Um, Pastor Allen will go ahead with his second message for the day and then the question and answer. So please stay with us to eat and we'll have our closing film right now. Thank you. Uh, what a profitable moment it is as we all ring out this wonderful song together after hearing such beautiful sermon and recommitting our heart to God and to our family. Let us join with our musicians as we sing 183. bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant you his peace now and forever. Amen. We'll be ushered out accordingly with the singing of 633 when we all get to heaven. Thank you. 
sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansion bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. While we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a star. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we will sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory. Will the toys of life repay when we all get to heaven? What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Onward. Onward to the prize before us, soon His beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day! of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus we will sing and shout the victory